Okay. Thank you, uh, Charles, for inviting me out here. I'm always happy to come up to Seattle because I actually did grow up in the Northwest, so uh, it's always nice to come up to, uh, especially on a sunny day, which I hear you haven't had in, in a little bit. So, um, oops. I am going to talk about personalized immunotherapy and some of the work that we've been doing at UCLA, and with the idea that that patients with glioblastoma have very defined mutations that seem to be different in every patient. So personalizing your treatment to, to every uh, patient's disease is probably the right way to go. And I think we've heard a lot about that today um, from the sequencing, and I'm going to talk about it from the immunology side. So the, these are my disclosures. Obviously, we do have some arrangements with some of the companies that we've been doing making vaccines with. but. To bring you to immunology, since this is not a usual way of thinking, especially from the clinical audience, I thought I'd go through what is currently understood about sort of the cellular interactions uh, that are involved in an idealized anti-tumor immune response. If it worked like this, I wouldn't be up here talking about novel ideas for immunotherapy, but cancer cells can be recognized by the immune system and can be eradicated, and it does happen in their there is clear evidence that, that it does work. Um, in, in an idealized anti-tumor immune response, the early um, recognition of tumor cells is usually by immune, innate immune cells, comprised usually granulocytes, macrophages, natural killer cells. You get engulfment of tumor cell debris by professional or facultative antigen-presenting cells, one of which is like a dendritic cell. Who cells whose sole job is to phagocytose, process, present. Um, and what we understand is that these cells will be into the tumor, they will phagocytose, they will become activated, they will drain into areas of lymphoid tissue, which is where we understand, and you can prime CD4 and CD8 T cell responses. And these cells will, will traffic back to the original tumor and lyse the remaining tumor cells. So this can and does happen. Uh, it obviously doesn't happen very well in patients that get cancer. So what is important, since T cells end up being the main mediator because cancer is an intracellular disease, it is a uh, disorder of intracellular pathogen, like a pathogen, like a virus. So the recognition of tumor-specific antigens right, has to come from mostly T cells. All right, T cells don't recognize free antigens in the environment. They recognize a peptide that has been then uh, put onto an MHC molecule. In humans, it's HLA molecules. So T cells don't recognize free um, EGFR. They don't recognize free HER2 or mutations. They recognize pieces of peptides that are complexed within the major histocompatibility complex. And and this is outlined here with, uh, with a dendritic cell presenting peptides to both CD4 and CD8 T cells. So our group at UCLA, we've been interested in developing sort of personalized immunotherapies um, using dendritic cells. Everybody has dendritic cells in different forms throughout the body. This is just a... Uh, These are actually just pictures from the laboratory of dendritic cells that have phagocytosed tumor cells um, and pr process and present them themselves on inso. So we got involved in this process a while back, and we figured that since dendritic cells were so good at processing and presenting uh, antigens that we could use them in an ex vivo way. All right, so dendritic cells stained with CD11B in red, a nuclear dye, and the green is actually tumor cells that have been phagocytosed that actually make it inside the cell. So we got involved in this process because there were several people at UCLA back then who were thinking about new ways of uh, using dendritic cells in uh, immunotherapy studies, and we asked whether, whether unfractionated parts of tumor 
tumor material, tumor cells, could actually be processed by dendritic cells and used as a vaccine. So, and one of the main problems with this, the immune system to target gliomas, is that there's certainly no good, well-recognized, and immunogenic types of, of antigens that are known to be recognized by the immune system. And certainly the single targeting of one antigen has not led to incredibly um, persistent objective clinical responses or extended survival in patients. And, and often the targeting of one antigen leads to immune escape. And some of the most promising new therapies are really these new uh, immune-based therapies that recognize and promote diverse antigen-specific T-cell responses. So the idea if you pr promote to a T cell response to one antigen, you're going to select for antigen uh, negative cells. If you promote it to a large array of different antigens on a tumor cell, it's much harder for that tumor cell to get away from that, that targeting. So several years ago, uh, Linda Liao and I, so Linda is a neurosurgeon at UCLA we've partnered with for many years. We kind of took some of the developing ideas at, at UCLA and asked whether uncharacterized sort of tumor proteins could be used as an antigen source um, to pulse onto dendritic cells and use this as a vaccine. And we published a lot of this initial work back in 1999, but the concept is essentially here. Uh, since the T cell targets are not well characterized, we created this personalized approach. And essentially, it is it is a tumor that can be resected by a surgeon. You make um, a single cell suspension after digestion. These tumor cells are actually freeze-thawed, and we get, we get what comes out of the cells when they freeze-thaw lice. And these are, are quantitated by protein. The patient actually then comes back and gets uh, leukapheresis. We in, uh, grow these monocytes with uh, these uh, growth factors, IL-4 and GMCSF, to make a a cultured dendritic cell, and then we, we basically co-culture the, the tumor lysates with the dendritic cells overnight, and then we give it as an, an a intradermal vaccine, usually together with an adjuvant. And the hope is that this will induce an immune response in the arm. The dendritic cells will migrate to a draining lymph node where they will interact with naive T cells that are circulating through. You can activate the T cells in the lymph node, those T cells will then be reactivated to go recognize the remaining tumor cells in the brain. So since we published, I think, these early studies, there's been a pretty strong interest, as you might suspect, uh, of dendritic cell vaccines. I think as of a couple years ago, there were at least 21 published papers uh, of clinical studies that are um, in this disease. And at UCLA, we translated a lot of these early findings into phase one, phase two clinical trials, um, in which I hold the, uh, the IND with the FDA. But we, based on these early studies that we did, we partnered with a, with a company, Northwest Biotherapeutics, to kind of move this out beyond our single institution studies, where dendritic cells, which are not easily made, and you need a GMP suite. So, while we have that at UCLA, not every institution has a good manufacturing suite where you can just culture um, monocytes in a GMP grade. Uh, so in, in collaboration with Northwest Biotherapeutics, we initiated uh, um, multi-center clinical trials, which one of which is uh, ongoing right now with, in a randomized fashion. So this is designed at of the study that's going on right now, and they're still accruing patients, so it's not, we're not going to talk about, about that. But with that background, I thought I would kind of provide some sort of additional thoughts and relevant issues about uh, personalized immunotherapy and, and what this means. And I, th I think there are essentially three issues that are pertinent, especially to you as clinicians. Um, one, which subtypes of GBM should be treated by immunotherapy. So we'll go through a couple of anecdotes. Why is vaccination um, in the setting of advanced disease or patients that are pro progressively growing, why is it less effective? And which target antigens should we be actually vaccinating? So 
Here's a tale of two tumors. This was shared by Linda Liao, who these were actually a couple of patients on our first phase one clinical trial. So both have tumors in the same, basic same location. And I assume the oncologist can help me out here if they need. These are patients that, that got surgery by, by Linda. They came out. They got standard chemo and radiation. We've been seen. How, and they were, they were vaccinated on our phase one clinical trial with a autologous tumor lysate pulse dendritic cell vaccine. But you can see the, you know, the survival is obviously quite a bit different. And we start wondering why one patient survives and one, one patient doesn't survive as long. So it became clear, and you've heard a lot of this, that a GBM is not a GBM, even though it's called a World Health Grade Organization, grade four tumor, there, there's a lot of heterogeneity. And a while back, Stan Nelson and, and Paul Michel at UCLA began looking at gene expression profiling of all these tumors. And as you've heard, there are several different subtypes of glioblastoma. And some of the early studies that they published, and even though they say type 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, these are essentially the proneural, the mesenchymal, and the uh, proliferative groups. These were compared with survival. And you can see there are some subtypes that definitely have different um, overall survival. And this group right here is the proneural group, which is enriched with the IDH mutations. This was confirmed by Heidi Phillips at, with the UCSF group. And they named it more this proneural, mesenchymal, and proliferative subtypes. And those seem to have caught on. And they essentially are enriched for gene gene groupings that are associated with neural development, um, classical proliferative and uh, markers, and invasion, uh, infl inflammation, and extracellular matrix. These are essentially what these probes are. And we sort of began to wonder whether vaccines might be having be uh, more effective long-term survival in, in different subtypes. So we did microarray gene expression profiling on the first 23 patients on our phase one trial and looked to see which subtypes and how well they did on survival. So one thing that was clear is that when we looked at the patients that had a proneural and a classical subtype, that, uh, that their survival was no different than what had been seen with uh, standard chemo and radiation in a large group of patients that was shown here. However, if you looked at our patients that had a mesenchymal all right, subtype, actually their survival turned out to be highly significantly elevated than what uh, you would normally see or you would expect to see. Um, and so we thought that was interesting. Why mesenchymal? Mesenchymal often has the worst prognosis. Why would these patients uh, have longer survival, especially on our dendritic cell trial? And if you actually look back, a lot of these patients had, uh, were enriched for these sort of pseudo-progressor cases, in which they look, uh, you know, after therapy, you see what looks like to be progression, but goes away on the T1, T2 flare. Um, but if you, if you think about the mesenchymal subtype, they actually are known to be associated with inflammation. So we began to wonder whether maybe these are more immunogenic type of cancers, or this subtype is more immunogenic. And it was clear that mesenchymal subtypes have more endogenous T cells even bef before therapy starts. And then after therapy, they have a significant uh, higher T cell content after therapy. So what we think is that different subtypes of tumors have, are different immunogenicity and have different endogenous immune responses. And by doing vaccine in these mesenchymal type patients, you're actually just reactivating a response that had already been there, and it's more effective that way. So one anecdote of what we've been working on. Secondly, why is vaccination in the setting of advanced disease or progressive disease less effective? This has been sort of the Achilles heel of any vaccination in preclinical models and even in patients. If patients are actively progressing on treatment, they are almost uniformly um, do not respond. So why is that? And could we develop models to sort of test what's going on? And we noticed certainly early on that in, 
in patients in our clinical trial that not only this did if they had progressive tumors at the time that we were beginning vaccination or if they had expression of some genes that are known to be immuno inhibitory such as TGF beta and IL-10 that these patients didn't mount responses they didn't induce t-cell infiltration after the vaccination so we began to think about mechanisms by which this might happen and see whether we could look more in preclinical models so we set up and went back and back to our preclinical model and this is just a mouse model all right these are mirroring glioma cells injected into the brains of mice and looking to see whether different treatments work now what I'm not showing is that if you vaccinate mice and then challenge with tumors we basically can cure mice However, if you wait for a tumor to become well established, meaning that it's progressively growing and you give the same, the same treatment, it doesn't work. All right? The survival of a dendritic cell vaccine, a tumor lysate pulse, or even a PD-1 blocking antibody, which is in the news these days, doesn't work. So this doesn't happen because you're not inducing immune response. We can see a robust inflammatory T-cell response. We can, we can get T-cells there, and they're even activated T-cells at the site. All right? So why is it that we're not getting uh, extended survival in a mouse model? Well, what we did notice is that vaccination in this setting induces a significant infiltration of a large proportion of early myeloid cells and macrophages. So this and uh, this is flow cytometry plots of different populations that are within tumors. And what we notice is that they express pd one uh, high levels of pd one pd l one is an immunomodulatory agent that binds to PD-1 on T cells, and it turns off their functional activity. So it wasn't the tumor cells that expressed pd one It was actually macrophages and myeloid cells and other. So since the... Since they express such high levels of PDL1, we reason that blocking the effects of PD1 or PDL1 on, on macrophages might actually be a strategy. So, when you do the same situation, you wait for a well established tumor, you give a dendritic cell vaccine, and you couple that with a antibody, blocking antibody to PD1, the survival is recovered. So, we see the same survival here that we see in the prophylactic setting. So, we also think, actually, this is relevant in, in humans. So we went back and looked at our patient population um, that were treated on a dendritic cell trial and looked at, this is hard to see here, but we're doing multiplex uh, staining for CD8 T cells that express PD-1. And it was clear that PD-1 was upregulated after vaccination. And if you did an ex vivo assay, to look at whether uh, you took out of a tumor, you grew T cells out of that, and looked to see whether they would kill the autologous tumor. If you blocked PD-1 right before they, you put on the tumor, the killing was significantly higher. So we think, we think this is a strategy that's, that's based on mechanism. And we're actually designing a new clinical trial right now in which dendritic cell vaccination is going to be combined with, uh, with a PD-1 blocking antibody. And the reason we think it's going, it's mayor, we hope it will work, is because this is the inherent biology of these types of tumors. Treating in the, in the no treatment situation, these tumors are not inherently immunogenic, except for some subtypes. There is no anti tumor immune response, and the tumor progresses. If you give dendritic cell vaccination alone, you can induce a T cell response, but you get this macrophage infiltration that, that basically inhibits what you just started in the, in the environment. If you give checkpoint blockade, oops, sorry. If you give PD-1 blocking antibody by itself, all right, it doesn't work because there's no endogenous immune response. So there aren't any T cells within the tumor that you can activate their, uh, their function. However, if you give if you induce a T cell response and you block a negative regulatory molecule um, with an antibody, then you can get significant uh, um, 
rejection of the tumor so based on this we we've already negotiated with a couple of companies with b m s and merck to partner with i didn't reach a vaccine and this hopefully clinical trial be starting up pretty soon and so lastly i think What's also important is which antigen should we be vaccinating against? I mean, what we're doing right now is, is we're taking primary tumor cells. We are freeze-thawing and taking lysate, all right? The vast majority of tumor lysate is going to be self, all right? It's not going to be specific. There's going to be a small minority of these proteins which have mutations or have antigens that, that you can activate the immune system, but the vast majority are going to be not relevant. So how can we enrich for the right antigens? And we think, based on a lot of the new sequencing data, gene expression data, that mutations and antigens and what's immunogenic seem to be different in every patient. So vaccinating against EGFR or vaccinating against Survivin or FA2, all right, you can do that and you can induce immune responses, but they're not inherently immunogenic in every patient. All right, it's kind of an all comers, but every patient's different. And what one patient responds to endogenously is not the same as the other. And I think that's, that's clear right now. And I think this comes on the heels of, you know, prominent studies that have come out lately where targeting one agent, targeting one antigen, right, leads both to loss and it hasn't really um, resulted in objective clinical responses over in randomized studies. So what are the best antigens that, uh, or which antigens does the host immune system recognize? Well, the majority of tumor-specific T cells actually don't recognize well-characterized um, tumor-associated antigens, all right? They figured this out mostly in melanoma a while back because this is one of the most immunogenic cancers, and they began looking to see whether the well-characterized melanoma antigens, all the T cells were specific. Uh, for them, and they were essentially finding out that the vast majority of all these tumor-specific T cells that they could come out of a tumor didn't recognize the ones that they thought they should be recognizing, you know, the pigment synthesis proteins, ART1, GP100, tyrosinase. So what they are finding is that actually T cells recognize mutation-specific epitopes. So somatic mutations in a tumor cause an amino acid change, which actually gets presented on MHC with a different uh, amino acid sequence. And that creates a new, a new target. That target is different for every patient, though. And it's specific to their somatic mutation burden. And I think this was figured out about five years ago. This is one of the early studies where, in a melanoma model, they, they did sequencing. So how does this work? Or how would you identify which patients that might, which patients and their tumor would have antigens that the immune system would recognize. The strategy is sort of outlined here. You can identify tumor-specific somatic mutations by gene expression. So what we've already talked about, RNA-seq, um, whole exome sequencing. You basically figure out the, the mutations. You screen them through uh, sequencing data. Then you actually filter in silico. And then using algorithms, you can figure out whether amino acid changes create epitopes on that patient-specific HLA. And you decide which ones should have enhanced binding. And actually, what's interesting, and I won't bother you with a lot of the details, but if you look at whether what T cells recognize, what classes of oncogenes or mutations, all right, they're really very few of the, t the immune response T cells recognize actual driver mutations. They recognize mutations, but they are pas basically passengers, passenger mutations. It has nothing to do with, with whether that's making this oncogene is making that cancer drive. The immune system recognizes just changes. And it's basically a random process that, recognize that creates a new protein, which cre creates enhanced binding on MHC. And the cancers that are the most immunogenic, all right, are the ones that have the most mutations. It's a numbers game. The more mutations you have, the greater the likelihood that a mutation will create a, 
a random new peptide all right, that binds on MHC. And it's clear that this is basically just a, a list of, of a whole bunch of different types of cancer and their somatic mutation rate that have gone through the, the, mostly the TCGA. Cancers that, that have the most mutations are the ones that you would expect. Melanoma, um, sunlight exposure, lung cancer, smoking, and colorectal cancer, uh, microsatellite unstable. Right? And if you look at the cancers that are responding to new diverse modes of immunotherapy, it's these ones right there, almost, almost universally. So where is GBM? It's somewhere in the middle. There are a variety of these cancers which have a high number of mutations. And I, th I think they figured out that about 10 uh, mutations per megabase will generate about 150 putative neal antigens. So there is a population of GBM that might be, and you could identify it using this prediction. Why is it that, that neal antigens would be better immune targets? Well, for one thing, it's, it's back to immunology, right? When a T cell develops in the thymus, self antigens, all right, induce tolerance, right? So if you have self antigens that are overexpressed on a melanoma, all right, the affinity of that T cell receptor for that antigen is low, all right? And this is why viruses, all right, you have really high avidity because they never saw that tolerance during development of the thymus. So new mutations that come up in cancer, cancer cells, are foreign and they look like a virus. So the effectiveness of a T cell recognizing a neoantigen is, is much more avid. And the other as, actually issue here is that overexpressed antigens on tumor cells, you get a lot more uh, off-target toxicity. So if you do adoptive transfer, like in melanoma, which is doing the rounds right now, adoptive transfer of melanoma-specific T cells into patients with with progressively growing metastatic melanoma. A lot of them recognize pigment synthesis proteins, GP100 tyrosinase, uh, GP100. And one of the off-target toxicity is autoimmune vitiligo, right? T cells are targeting tumor cells, but they're also targeting normal cells that have pigment, pigment proteins. So you get depigmentation, you get vitiligo. So, the off-target toxicity is much higher with self-antigens, not with neoantigens. So is there evidence for this proof in, in patients? Certainly, yeah. There's new exome analysis. Tone Schumacher is a guy in, in um, the Netherlands who first coupled tumor exome analysis with, with the identification of neoantigens that could be recognized by T cells. And this was done in melanoma. You can isolate tumor cells, identify tumor-specific mutations, predict these epitopes, grow out infiltrating tumor cells, and screen to see which, which of these mutations are doing. So at UCLA in the Brain Tumor Program, every tumor that gets operated on, we create a, a xenograph, patient-derived xenograph, and we grow out their tumor-specific T cells in culture. We do screening with, with uh, exome, RNA-seq, and we grow out T cells, and we're actually sequencing the T cell repertoire of every T cell expanded culture to start cloning T cells in their specific. So, one of the other things is how can we do this in mouse models? We need to be able to. So, using our mouse glioma model, we actually we did uh, RNA seq and, and whole exome sequencing on a GL261, which is just a mirroring glioma line. We found a whole set of mutations. We did predictions. We found which ones were expressed and which ones could be verified. So in this line, we, we found eight mutations. And this is actually one of the mutations where you can see that uh, the amino acid change right here actually creates an affinity of a nanomolar with the T cell receptor. It's a strong binder. And it tells you which uh, MHC class it actually aligns with. And this is actually. Um, you know, a group of antigens that we found based on the mutations that create epitopes that have strong binding. And when you vaccinate with tumor 
lysate pulse dendritic cells, you can actually find T cells that are specific to some of these antigens. And in particular, one that we pulled out is actually known to be a, a mutated uh, antigen in this line. So we began to do this in patient samples, obviously. The next step is, can you do this and can you do it in a, in a relatively quick fashion? Can patients with tumor lysate pulse dendritic cells, can you start figuring out what's their mutations? And if you're vaccinating with tumor lysate um, on dendritic cells, are any of these T cells that you prime recognizing neoantigens? And we're in the middle of this. So I will let you know in a year. So I think the conclusions is that I think immunotherapy is an exciting new field. It uh, may likely be relevant for a glioblastoma in the near future. Well, there are a lot of um, ongoing clinical trials going right now. Not all glioblastomas are likely to be sensitive. I think there's some subtypes that are um, more likely to respond to an immune-based therapy, and we got to learn how to predict. Some of these patients are likely to have incomplete tumor resections from the clinical side. This is hard to treat because of the adaptive immune resistance that develops, and combinatorial strategies probably likely going to be going to be important. The identification of patient-specific neoantigens, I'm sure, is going to be relevant. But the ability to do it in, in a straightforward and fashion that you can do it and um, make a difference for patients is really what the future is going to hold. So with that, it's a large group, um, but it's a good group, and we all work together. And I think that's part of the thing. You need to do work like this. You need basic science people. You need surgeons. You need oncologists. You need postdocs and funding. All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.